So we will have Mary Delaquil. Isn't that a cool name? Yes, Delaquil. Um, who is an epidemiologist from MDH. And I saw this presentation at one of the state meetings on Friday and it sucks and it's sad, but it's super important, of course. And I, I would hope that we can start making a lot of conversation after this talk or during this talk. I know she's open to answering questions throughout and um, I think it's good to, to chat in or interrupt when the question comes up because we will be on a slide with a graph. I think it's easier to discuss it real time. All right. So yes, yeah, so she'll be on now. So announcements, uh, very quickly, remember this is recorded, but man, we wish you had your video on so we can see you. Even Charlie Reznikoff has his video on. So uh, I think everyone else, yeah, and he waves. So remember there's free CME. And uh, I was just talking with somebody about this yesterday, how nice that is to get this free stuff. So there is free CME. Next slide. I don't have oh. the slide control, thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Katie's in control today. Um, okay, yeah, so let us know if there's multiple people in your room, chat us in the names, rename yourself. Again, videos are always appreciated. Yeah, you get extra CME if you have your video on. That's not true. Okay, next slide. So can pre case presentations, if you have anything that you'd like to run by, and we can do this very informally even at the end of any talk. So if there's a case that you want to throw at the crowd, feel free. Upcoming. Look at how fast we filled this calendar. Katie must be so proud of us. Um, usually we're running and bugging Charlie to fill in. So um, next week, actually, Dr. Andy Baker, and I cannot believe he filled in so fast. He is the head medical examiner at Hennepin County. He did a talk for us actually during COVID and he has a lot of information about all of the opioid stuff. And I just think hearing it from the medical examiner's perspective and all of that, very interesting. Hmm. Yeah, oh, and then perfect. after that, we have the Rural AIDS Action Network and they're coming as well. And local and national drug trends. Uh, we have a lot of great talks coming up. So with that. And then the first and third Tuesdays of the month, we are still doing that echo, which goes through September. That is how you register. Uh, upcoming next week, we're talking about opioid use disorder in pregnancy two weeks later uh, with neonatal abstinence. And you can read the rest. There's a bunch. Remember that the addiction connection, actually something came out yesterday and I honestly, I can't remember what it was. I think it might've been. The anticonvulsants used off-label for the treatment of alcohol use disorder. Yeah. And that. Uh, so that podcast is done and there will be or there will be a podcast coming on with some of the other off label uh, medications uh, in the next few weeks. We're just more worried or worried, excited about Charlie's one with the methadone clinic changes with uh, now COVID's calming down. But all right. Remember, if you need some technical assistance, please call us. You have our numbers. Take a picture of it. Next slide. OK, so. Katie, you can probably take those slides down. Awesome. So we will have, oh, there's Mary. I can see her, Mary Delaquil from the from MDH, an epidemiologist who I cannot even believe this data you're all about to see. Um, I want to thank you so much, Mary, though, for, for stepping in and doing this extremely last minute for us. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to, if you want to give a little bit more of an intro on yourself, that'd be fantastic. And are can, you sharing your own slides? Can I thank her too for coming or just you? No, you absolutely can. Okay. Thank you very much for coming, Mary. Not just Heather. All right, you'll need to unmute. You're muted. So did you want me to share my own slides? I can't remember. Yes. If you okay, have it here for you, sometimes that's just smoother. Okay, yep, that's totally fine. So let me just. Um... <sighs> and again, people, if you want to, you know, raise your hand or chat in a question or just um, ask questions as we go, it's it's just sometimes easier when we're on the slide that the questions come from, um, yep, just... especially for Mary, <laughs> rather than jumping around. So I don't know um, what your usual is for this group. I don't know if you usually um, <clears throat> uh, ask questions during or if you like to save them for the end. It really doesn't make any difference to me. So whatever whatever you guys are used to doing is, is fine with me. 
Okay. So I guess we'll just kind of play it by ear, whatever people, if you feel an urge to ask a question throughout or you want to wait till the end, we're just, we'll just roll with it. Yeah. And if you chat them in, we'll probably hold them till the end and then we'll run through them. So you don't have to worry, Mary. We'll just, uh, we'll kind of keep track of the ones that come in and then shoot them at you at the end. Awesome. Thank you. Um, okay, great. So I'm assuming you can see my first slide. Yep. Please tell me that you can. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> Fab. So um, thanks for the invite. I can see that um, I already have the wrong date. This is because I used the same presentation on Friday for the OREC Council. Um, and one of the people, I think it was Dr. Bell, knew she was there at that meeting. And, and when John Cole had to cancel because he got double booked, she asked me if I could do the same presentation. So I'm not John Cole. I love his presentation. So anyone who uh, is feeling disappointed, I'm not taking it personally because um, I enjoy, I also enjoy Andy Baker's presentations as well. So um, anyway, uh, so I think, I believe that this, this subcommittee or whatever you call it is about rural, um, more rural needs or specifics. And because this was such a late minute um, ask. I don't have a lot of rural specific data to share with you. However, please, um, my email will be on the last slide. Just reach out to me if you want um, some more rural specific analyses with um, overdose fatality. Yeah. So and my name's, oh, go ahead. Pretty good span. We do have a lot of uh, outstate, you know, participants, but it's pretty much any kind of healthcare provider. So, Okay, super. So my name is Mary Dale Quill. I'm one of the drug overdose epidemiologists, and my specialty is mortality. I work in the injury and violence prevention section under Mark Kindy. I also um, have dabble in um, violent deaths and fall mortality, but my main focus and my main funding from the CDC is for a drug overdose mortality. And what we're going to be talking about today I, is the first look at the 2021 data um, coming from the death certificates. We're also taking a look at the final-ish 2020 numbers. Um, they, they could change, though, because we are having problems getting the final data set from the Office of Vital Records in-house. So here are some of the key takeaways I find from this presentation that in 2021, overdose mortality became the leading cause of injury death in Minnesota. It's overtaking false mortality. That the drug overdose increased 22% from 2020 to 2021. That's probably going to go up. Greater, metro, greater Minnesota saw a larger increase in overdose deaths when compared to the metro area. That's not typical. Usually the metro area sees a greater increase. And that statewide overdose mortality rate masks significant racial disparities, which are growing worse. So, so this is the chart we try to use to show the leading causes of injury death in Minnesota. You can see over the years, MV motor, motor vehicle accidents went down. Suicide kind of staying in the same trend, slightly trending up, and how 100% alcohol attributable deaths, overdose poisonings, and falls all going upwards. I don't have the 2021 numbers on this graph because it is coming from the CDC and they don't have those numbers except for poor provisional ones. But based on looking at the death certificates in these three areas, it does look like in Minnesota overdoses are gonna be taking the lead, which will you know, be the first time ever for injury deaths. So can I, I'm sorry, I can't figure out how to raise my hand. This is Beth That's okay. Duluth. So the overdose slash poisoning deaths are separated from the, those are unintentional or accidental? Or These are all manner of deaths. So and I know it's confusing because suicide has its own line on here. I didn't make this graph. So, but except for suicide, which obviously is a manner of death, and they're talking about all mechanisms in that case, the other ones are the, the cause of death. Got it. And they're Thanks. for all intents. Yep. Thanks. Sure, no problem. 
it's I it's nice to get asked that question because a lot of times people don't see that dichotomy in that graph. So. So here are just the trend lines. Now, this presentation, as I said, this is talking about Minnesota residents. Depending on who needs the data and what they need it for, sometimes I give them a current deaths, which is deaths that happened in the state, regardless of residency. But all these charts here, I believe, are all dealing with deaths among Minnesota residents. And then for 2021, only the deaths that occurred in Minnesota because that's the data we have currently. Um, if you ever have any questions, especially on a more granular level, like say on a county level or in a community level about how many actual deaths occur, that's something particularly that law enforcement tends to be interested in because they're not, they don't care what state residency you say on your driver's license, they wanna know what's going on in their specific area. Just feel free to send me, um, you know, send me an email and we can talk about that. So we can see here the deaths have been going up. Um, they've been going up since before 2021. We had that one blip down in 2018. Unfortunately, it was not the start of a downward trend. It's a little hard to see the rate of increase in this graph, but I can let you know that greater Minnesota um, increased 23% compared to the seven county metro area increasing 20%. And that's the first time greater Minnesota increased more than the metro area since 2014. And I don't know why that's happening. Um, in fact, I'd be interested if we have time, if anyone has um, you know, ideas about why that might be happening this year. Um, I, I think it's safe to say that different things drive overdose deaths, although there's a lot of commonalities. There are different things driving overdose deaths in the city area compared to the more rural areas. So this shows some non-exclusive drug categories. And I just use, usually this graph looks like a plate of colored spaghetti because we, we have uh, at least three or four more categories than what I have here on. But in this case, I just kept the categories that, oops, sorry about that, everyone. I just kept the categories that increased from 2020 to 2021. And it's the all opioid involved deaths. So that's like a category. It doesn't any, some opioid was involved in the death. A synthetic opioid was involved in the death, which pretty much always means fentanyl and pretty much always means illicit fentanyl. Psychostimulants which pretty much always means methamphetamine and then the cocaine deaths. These are based on the ICD-10 codes, um, not on the categories like how I would look at them from toxicology testing. So my notes did not transfer over. Hold on one second. If you oh, why pull out cocaine from the psychostimulants? So that's just because that's the way they are coded um, because cocaine happens to have its own code and I can pull it out, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's a lot of other categories I'd like to be able to pull it out, but I cannot, basically. So here we go. There's my notes. Um, and the cocaine is notable because you can see that line is pretty flat, but even though the numbers aren't particularly large, cocaine did increase 81% compared to 2020. And that's the highest increase among all the categories that we can separate out for. Um, let's see, opi any opioid involved death, those deaths increased 35%. The Synthetic opioids, again, basically fentanyl and fentanyl analogs increased 49%. And fentanyl was involved uh, in 90% of all the opioid involved deaths. Say, Mary, this is Kurt Devine. See, I'm just wondering, yeah. it's interesting to me because anecdotally, I've been telling people that I've seen way more cocaine on urine drug screens in the last six to 12 months than I have ever seen in the previous years. Do we have any idea why why that's happening? Oh, somebody else asked you that question Aaron's too. You read Erin's mind. She actually asked it first. Okay. <laughs> but 
but yeah. yeah. So um, that's a great question. And I can say a couple of things. I can say that we are in line with the rest of the country. In fact, unfortunately, all our data is basically in line with the rest of the country, except that um, the CDC nationally, the overdose totals increased by about 15 percent. Minnesota is higher than that. But when we get into the categories, cocaine's increasing in pretty much every state across the board. When I listen to other states talk, that would be a great question for Ryan, because I think law enforcement is seeing more cocaine out there from what I've heard anecdotally. Um, I, you know, we've always been able to separate the cocaine category out with the deaths. I, so I don't really understand yet. Maybe I'll get some insight as, as we look at this this year, why cocaine is more involved. Did the price change? Did the access change? Did the, you know, so. Could, could I share a theory on this? Oh, absolutely. Please. At, at the onset of the COVID epidemic, I did some research on sort of what predicting what could happen. And the World Health Organization submitted a report. I can find it if you want it saying that the global economic condition is likely to force subsistence farmers to change their products to more profitable products because of the economic global economic stress that was being noticed then. What always happens historically is if you can get by growing wheat, you grow wheat. If you're starving to death and desperate for money, you switch to more profitable crops. And what the World Health Organization said in April 2020 is watch out because cocaine is coming. Hmm. So I thought that was interesting. I get you that reference if you want. Yeah, I would love that reference. That sounds vaguely familiar. I think I saw like an article about that article. At way back then, but um, you're kind of bringing it back to my and mind. And I wonder, well. you know, I know that for a while and, and this one, this was on uh what is it? The show Trafficked when they do like the documentary docu series, and they were talking about the fentanyl coming in across the Mexican border. But initially, when the, they were producing the fentanyl in Mexico, they were getting all the chemicals from China first. So they showed the whole ship thing, and then there was this transition to they can make it their own. But they did say there was this pause while they were transitioning from overseas to local and you know the cocaine might have just been easier to make you know kind of like what charlie said too so mm -hmm. and i i have heard that like there's there's been um kind of like the meth with meth psychostimulants meth was increasing 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 and then we kind of had a slowdown it kept on increasing but it kind of slowed down i think you can kind of see that on the graph in like 2017 2018 in 2016. And I think what I've heard from various law enforcement, it was because of the switchover from local meth producers to now most of the meth coming from Mexico. Sure. And Adrian, it took a while for that, that supply switchover. Yeah. And Adnan has also commented that Afghanistan has switched from THC to cocaine farming as a result of that whole thing as well. So um, yeah, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, this is great. And it's, I think it's really interesting to me to just think about, especially whenever we are in line with what's being seen nationally or even perhaps globally, then it's really interesting to like broaden our focus out and say what, you know, what is happening, you know, far, you know, far away from Minnesota, basically, but is very much having an effect here in Minnesota. So do you have any, when you're having your CDC meetings, do you ever have, um, like the height of people, like, I mean, you said, you know, Ryan, of course, but do you have any of like the DEA people that sit down and you have all these discussions all together and brainstorm this? Because I mean, they would obviously know what's happening at least across borders and trends and, and you know, drug traffic lines, but I was just curious more for. Yeah. So like, so the, the national meetings are usually run by ONDCP, the, you know, the office of national drug policy, I can't remember that exact acronym. And it, 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 the region it's focusing on switches around the country. Tomorrow is Midwest. I'll be presenting for like five minutes. And so will Haley McCarran. She'll be um, presenting for Haida because I believe everyone in law enforcement has some big conference this week. And so there, none of the rest of people like Ryan and Kent and people can't be there, but, um, 
So that's more, and then frequently the DEA will do um, larger like end presentations there. And that's kind of where we get that information. I will say for me personally, it's so much more that I'm gathering the information and trying to make sense of it in the smaller context. Um, I, I don't know that I've been in any like kind of a, you know, things are just so different, I guess, really, because of the pandemic. You know, I, I haven't been going to conferences. I haven't been going to reverse site meetings for CDC grants and things like that. So, no, we haven't. Things are like changing and going up so much, but we haven't really been able to gather in a group the way we were able to three or four years ago. So hopefully that'll that'll come back. Right. And then uh, good policy decisions and stuff will come out of that. So not shown on this slide is the fact that deaths involving commonly prescribed opiate, opioids and methadone decrease 11%. Again, just um, continuing that trend of prescription drug related overdoses are still going down. They've been going down you know, now for years since at least, I don't know, 2015 or something like that. Heroin deaths also decreased 20%. That's not shown here. Heroin deaths, as you all probably know, people, some people might think they're using heroin, but when you actually look at um, drug results, it's, it's, uh, they're not tox results. I mean, <clears throat> And the other category that went down is deaths involving benzodiazepines that decreased 19%. So that's what we're looking at when we're looking at categories. Um, again, you can see, uh, I don't have it on this particular slide because the scale would have made things weird, but basically um, these three categories or really two, because cocaine is a stimulant, as someone pointed out, synthetic opioids and stimulants are what are driving our increases here in Minnesota. And again, that's pretty much in line with what's happening nationally. So this is just showing the presence of synthetic opioids, again, fentanyl, in, in total overdose deaths in Minnesota in 2021, just to give the scope of the problem. So I was saying that 90% of the opioid involved deaths included fentanyl, 65% of all deaths included fentanyl, overdose deaths included fentanyl. And again, we are just talking about um, poisoning toxicity deaths. If somebody had a drug on board and they um, had a bad fall or a motor vehicle accident, those numbers are not included in this data. These are actual, so it's not where a drug was a contributing cause. It is an actual overdose death um, that we're talking about here. Okay, that was very odd. Sorry, I am a... Uh, my notes decided to disappear again. Let me find them. So in here, I just um, did a little pie chart to just uh, talk about multi mult multiple substances being on board. I don't think this is news to anyone here in this audience, but the vast majority of deaths, this isn't a hard and fast analysis because the data, the 2021 data, I wasn't able to analyze at all. But when you're looking at death certificates, um, the death certificates that actually name specific deaths on the death certificate, that number is going up. We used to be in the 70s. Now we're closer to mm, in the 80s. And of the death certificates where we're looking at actually named drugs, it doesn't just say mi mixed drug toxicity, for instance. But although that would count for in this particular graph, these are the, these are the percentage of, of deaths that had more than one drug on board. And it, it is the vast majority of them. And as I'm sure everyone here is, you know, totally aware of, I mean, how, what you do for a mixed drug overdose when you're trying to treat it and reverse it is different than if somebody is just overdosing on heroin, for instance, and you can just administer naloxone. And of course, we I don't have a slide on this because this wasn't in scope of this presentation, but this would be an interesting group to talk about. I've been talking a lot about this with um, Ryan and Haley and other people in Haida and law enforcement is how xylazine is moving from, it seems, from east to west across the country. We are seeing xylazine 
in Minnesota overdose deaths. I'm not sure how aware of it people are clinically with non-fatal overdose deaths. You know, I know you guys don't do a lot of toxicology testing with non-fatal overdose deaths, but I'm guessing everyone here is aware of how the presence of xylazine can make um, reversing an overdose so much more challenging. Um, and, uh, you know, our numbers in Minnesota are still small, but in the past two years, they've more than doubled. So they are increasing at um, a concerning rate, even though the actual number is still um, under 100, let's say. Can I ask you a question? I thought it might be after this slide. Okay. You know, in trying to determine the cause of death with a stimulant-related death, mm -hmm. that it's it's hard on autopsy to say based on the findings in the ME's office specifically, rather than findings at the scene or the other history. And my question is, my, is it true or is this accurate? My understanding is, is that many of the stimulant-related deaths have opioids on board because the stimulant-related death would be, I mean, what kills people in that situation is really hyperthermia and maybe um, seizures. So the bottom line is probably hyperthermia and metabolic acidosis, as opposed to respiratory failure or something else that's more tangible in the autopsy suite. Mm -hmm. So my understanding is, do you have any, the other thing is so tying together any sense of stimulant deaths without opioids present, what that number is like? Yes, I do. Now, let me see if I have it here. <laughs> Ben, okay. it's funny you asked that question. You just asked it very differently, but we uh, we had quite the discussion with, I mean, and Dr. Ann Pocus is on that call on Friday and we had a whole somehow trying to analyze how you can tell what was the cause, but that, that exact kind of topic came up, but I don't, yeah, here it is. Yeah, so in the psychostimulant drug category, they had another substance was involved 70% of the time and virtually all of those was some kind of opioid. There might, I, I do have the numbers. I, you know, if you send me an email or if you want me to send an email afterwards, I can give you the exact breakdown because I did look at it. There were some psychostimulant drug categories that came as, um, they, there was also cocaine on board. So the way, the death certificates get coded by the national organization whose acronym just has left my mind, but I know you all know who I mean. Minnesota and none of the other states, we don't code our deaths anymore. It's all done in, programmatically at the national level. So even though the cause of death, depending on you know where it's coming from in the country, depending on the ME, even though the cause of death might be respiratory failure, anoxic brain injury, or in psychostimulant, it's you know hypothermia or something like that. If it gets coded as basically being a drug toxicity death, then it got pulled into this analysis. I wasn't using the actual line on the death certificate for the cause of death. Um, there's just, that's just not the way that we pull it when we look at the death certificate. So to answer your other question, even if just meth was the only drug on board and a medical examiner looking at an autopsy might say, well, meth wasn't the cause of death. If the, if the, if the, coding people or program decided that the meth toxicity was the cause of death, then it went into this bucket. I, I don't know if I'm making sense. And if they somehow decided that in this particular case, based on whatever information was put into the death certificate, the meth toxicity was just a contributing factor to the cause of death, then they're not here. And I can give you like the numbers to say how many were in the one bucket as a contributing cause and how many are in the bucket as like cause of death. I think that's kind of like getting around the kind of question you're answering. It's yes, it's it's you know, it's it's certainly an imperfect system. And it would, I think, if we had more time and people sometimes, it, you know, those would be fishing expeditions. But what what does it look like when we're looking at contributing causes of death compared to cause of death? Right. Like what do those groups look different? Are they in different regions? Are they, you know, and on and on and on. We could see if that's a meaningful difference. 
So yes. I think if I had to put Thank this you. into context, you know, from Beth's perspective as a toxicologist, you know, really trying to understand how do you know that it was the meth or the psychostimulant with opioid on board versus X, Y, Z. And I, it, you know, that's, that's like crazy analysis and how they can determine that from a sheet of paper, you know, autopsy. And I think the first bullet point on this slide helps immensely because when I've been asked, so, okay, we have lots of methamphetamine in St. Louis County and the number of deaths are increasing or the numbers are increasing, then what's the cause of, I mean, I struggled with what's the cause of death. I, I think, again, this first bullet point answers that. There are other things on board. I mean, in St. Louis County, I can give you a more granular analysis too in just that region, right? Yeah. If, yeah. if it, you know, if you ever have a place where you really want to give more specifics to like the city council or something like that. So thank you. Um, so yeah, the next point here, again, we're talking about multi-substance involvement. Um, 88% involving benzodiazepines had other drugs involved and 80% of that were opioid involvement. And then most cocaine deaths had multi-substance involvement. It was not just cocaine. I think it was like 29 or something that was just had cocaine. And of course, I, you know, everyone here, I'm sure understands data is not, you know, we want the data to be perfect. We want it to be completely accurate. And of course, you know, that's, that's just not the human world we live in. Um, you know, sometimes results are going to be missed. Some things, sometimes things are not going to be coded correctly. Um, sometimes deaths don't make it into our bucket because uh, there were so many questions about what happened. It didn't get filed until six months later. So it got filed into the death certificate system after I pulled for my analysis. You know, it's just, it, you know, anything can kind of, can kind of contribute to things not being perfect. Um, but so far I have yet to find like a systemic error that would really be skewing the numbers. So, you know, I, I don't take the individual numbers as perfect, but as what the numbers are saying about the trends, where there are more deaths, where there are less deaths and things like that, that seems to be consistent and accurate. So this is an important slide that we are always very concerned about at MDH. Ever since we've basically been looking at overdose deaths as their own category starting in 2016. This slide's only going back to 2018, but that was just, I just did that for ease of reading, is how um, the breakdown racially and um, the racial rate disparity keeps on increasing, American Indians are now nine times more likely to die of an overdose death than whites. That's up from 2018 when they were six times more likely. African Americans have been around three times more likely, but they went up 2.7, they went up to 3.3 from 2.7 from 2018 to 2021. So, um, yeah, we we share these we share this data with the American Indian tribal nations. We share this data with the African American communities. The other part of the overdose data to action grant, there's a lot of prevention strategies. They are doing um, they are partnering with community and local public health to do fatality reviews. And there are two African American groups and one or two American Indian groups that are specifically focusing on um, racial, uh, racially targeted fatality reviews to, to try to answer these questions. Although, you know, in many ways we do know what's causing this disparity. And um, I don't think I have the official no, because the CDC doesn't have the 2021 data, but as far as I can tell, America, Minnesota will continue to be in the unfortunate lead of having the worst American Indian um, OD rate in the country at 157 uh, per 100,000. So. 
none of us, well, we don't really like any of these slides, I guess. We, we don't like that one. We don't really like any of them. So here's the age breakdown slide. Basically all groups in 2021 increased except for the 85 and older. Um, the group with the highest increase was the actual under 14, but the numbers are still very low. I think it went up like from seven deaths to 14 deaths. So obviously we would prefer to see no increases, but you can see here looking at the side that the largest affected age group is still the 25 to 34. Um, the I believe it was the 45 to 54 group is the one that saw um, like the next highest percentage increase after the 85 and older and the 14 and younger. So obviously if anybody needs more information, more age specific information about, for instance, like, you know, well, which drugs are which age groups, which drug categories are which age groups falling in, you know, that please just, just reach out to me for, more specific detail about that kind of thing. You know, Mary, just a question. You know, it's interesting because I had this conversation with somebody yesterday about, you know, for instance, in our, our school, Xanax was very common. Uh, and that was probably one of the biggest issues. And I think that, uh, you know, Xanax isn't Xanax anymore that people are buying on the street, right? It's, and I'm wondering if there's been any work done on, are these people that are buying things, these younger kids, are buying things that aren't what they're supposed to be, uh, that, you know, the, the typical drugs that we'd see in the high schools and the colleges, Adderall, mm -hmm. which has been tainted as well. Mm -hmm. it's not. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. And some form of this question always comes up um, when I'm talking to, you know, people who work in this field in some way, right? And I actually asked this question of, was it Ryan? I'm not sure. It was at one of my one of the LE meetings I was attending. And I can't remember who I asked it of. But basically, you know, what I asked, do people know what they're buying or not, basically? And then you're kind of asking, like, how does that break down by age? And the answer they gave to me was, now that's the kind of information we don't get in the death certificate. That's the first thing. So. Um, there's just no place on the death certificate to really put that kind of information. And it's not, you know, from the medical examiner's point of view, it has nothing to do with figuring out the cause or the intent, usually. It could make a difference with the intent, I guess. But anyway, um, these, but the answer Ellie gave to me just last week or the week before was like, they basically said, we think it's about 50-50. 50% uh, of the people know what they're getting or or they know that they don't know. And then about 50% of the people, you know, don't know and they don't realize they don't know, if, if that makes sense. That, that's a very awkward way to say that. I'm, I'm realizing it as it's coming out of my mouth. No, no I think it's, it's, it makes sense. They don't know what they don't know. Um, and it's kind of like we had this discussion on Friday about that whole, was it their first time using, like they took, you know, they took a pill thinking it was the Xanax and they didn't actually have an opioid use disorder. Um, and again, that was one of those answers that it's like not on the death certificate and need to, need to, sorry, Beth, I just got distracted because she said, yeah, when some patients say, I trust my dealer, you know, sometimes they don't even know probably what they have and they're giving or selling or whatever. So yeah, I mean, I will say, and I said this in the, the presentation on Friday, so the information, that information to those kind of questions is not on the death certificate. However, thanks to the Overdose Data to Action Grant, there's another surveillance system that from 2019 all on has all overdose deaths in it, and these deaths are abstracted on a case level. And we have a much better idea about whether the person had a substance use history we have a much better idea whether they've had previous overdoses because all those variables are being asked and we're looking for that information. We're also looking if there's any kind of law enforcement information attached to the case about, you know, whether they were a naive user, whether they were recently released from treatment, released from treatment, you know, kind of what I mean. If they recently came out of treatment or they were released, recently released from um, a correctional facility, 
you know, there's all kinds of things that can affect people's uh, level of use and what they're used to using. And, and we try to collect all that. And we collect, if the data is there, we're going to collect it. There's like over 600 possible variables to collect in that system about the circumstances and the history of the people. And I will say that it, it appears that the vast majority of the overdose deaths in Minnesota are people who have a history of substance use. That it is not um, an 18 year old just trying something and or thinking they're just taking a Xanax before they take their finals and it, and it ended up having fentanyl and it killed them. That does not seem to be um, a large category. I should be able to start analyzing that data. Like I said, they only started doing all overdose deaths in 2019. We started getting funding, I should say, to do all those deaths in 2019. And sometime at the end of summer, I should have a completed 2021 data set. So I'll have three years of data to analyze. And I'll be able to get much more granular information about the circumstances surrounding the death, answering this kind of question. like. You know, did they have a history of substance use? Did they have a history of overdoses? Was naloxone administered? Was there any bystanders around? Was there any witnesses to the drug use? Um, did they have anything in the PDMP? Am I saying that right? I, I think yeah. so. You know, yep. we don't have access to that, but you know, we 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 the MEs have access to it. And if they make notes about, you know, they had a prescription, then then we find out that kind of thing. And to be clear, um, Mary. When you have that information, we're gonna have you back. Right, right, absolutely, yeah. And I totally wanna, I, I wanna give that information. The challenge with that is that there are so many variables, potential variables that it's, it's, it's hard. Probably what we'll focus on is the ones that we actually get answers for, right? Because there's some variables like, um, you know, we have, we get a lot of information. Suicides go into the same system. And we get a lot of information about mental health variables when we're looking at into suicides. But when we're looking at um, accidental overdose deaths, we frequently don't get a lot of mental health information. So and yeah, and sometimes Aaron, we get treatment information. Sometimes we don't, you know, things like that. And the question, Erin, you just asked about the whole post jail release versus not that that's in that other realm of data, if I'm remembering that answer correctly, Mary. And then yeah. one other thing we discussed that hasn't been like further broken down is whether that person who had this overdose death from opioids received Narcan, you know, it right. was that report and, and did they receive and that? The, and the good news about, the good news about that system is there's also a toxicology tab and virtually every overdose death gets um, NMS toxicology run on it now. And we put all the toxicology results in there. So if xylazine was present, um, that's getting into the toxicology results. If one of the like levamisole and the other um, adulterants that I can't remember, some of which can affect clinicians treatment and things like that, we, the information, if it's in the toxicology test, it's, it, and that stuff, at least in the past was never put on the death certificate. I think in 2022, the MEs have made a change. Maybe Dr. Baker can answer that when you see him, ask him, because I'm interested. Um, if they've started putting xylazine on the death certificate whenever it was present in the tox test, because I think the MEs are now changing that, that uh, what they're doing with that. Yeah, that's a great question for him next week. I think the next one to ask would be, does do they- Don't I, tell him it was for me though. I, <laughs> he knows oh, my I, name. <laughs> You should be on with an alias next week. Um, <laughs> Some person from MDH asked this. Yeah. That's funny. All right, Mary, well, Mary, is that that last data that you're reviewing now from, I think you said 2019, is that from the newer, you know, so Mendoza started and then subsequent to Mendoza, there was specific fatality review or reporting um, for for hospitals. Is that that data set? No, that's that's something different. So this okay. Mendoza started with Terra and, and that's like a, you know, it's still kind of really a pilot, right? It, it only involves you know, your hospitals up in Duluth and then H Hennepin Healthcare came back on board after they started and they were gone because of the ketamine thing and um, yeah, all that kind of stuff. So it, this it is, I mean, it's separate from Mendoza, but not. So Mendoza is dealing mostly with non-fatal overdose. So yeah, 
and if they and what, die, it's it's a case of interest. This is actually suitors. That's the acronym for it: State Unintentional Drug Overdose Reporting System. I think it is. Yeah, it started in mid twenty seventeen. Yeah, but it only had opioid involved deaths at that time. Okay, Thanks. and then the next grant cycle, which started in twenty nineteen with OD two A, that included all overdose deaths. Previous to that, we were also doing all American Indian overdose deaths. So for like American Indian analysis, I have a, a you know, it's a subgroup where I have a lot of information as well because of the racial rate disparity we saw in an earlier slide. So, um, so unfortunately I can like, uh, chop up the data in a lot of different ways. And then when I'm talking, when I'm showing you this data, again, it's coming from death certificates and it includes all intents. When I'm talking about suitors data, that includes undetermined and unintentional. It does not include suicide overdose deaths of which is not a large percentage. And this all suicides are put into that system, but they're part of the violent deaths and they have a different timeline. So like the 2021 suicides will be a whole year behind the 2021 unintentional overdose deaths. So sometimes I feel like that's a big part of my job is trying to explain, you know, the differences between the different data sources and how we're seeing it's the same, we're seeing slightly different views of overdose data. I hope that answered your question. I might have it might have went into too much detail there. So, and this is just a look, because so I frequently, I never know if people are going to ask what's happening by gender, and um, and this is what's happening by gender. It's it's more male than female. Um, you know, the past few years, the female's been trending down ever so slightly, the male's been trending up ever so slightly. Um, it's not... Um, for me anyway, it's not pointing to anything specific to work on for you know policy or um, prevention, but the, of course that, that isn't my field either. So I, I could be, I could be wrong. So here's just another way where I'm gonna recap the things that I thought were important when I looked at this data set that polysubstance is growing and commonly involves synthetic opioids that are overall low state mortality rate. So compared to other states in the country, Minnesota, we're not West Virginia, we're not Ohio. Our mortality, our overdose rate is quite low. I'm pretty sure we're in the bottom quarter, if I'm remembering, maybe even in the bottom 15. I haven't, I haven't looked recently, but it, it's, it is growing. We're again at the highest ever, ever numbers. For 2021, we had 1,286 Minnesota residents die and 1,344 occurrent overdose deaths in the state. It's the highest ever. And, um, but if you look at the total mortality rate, we're really not seeing what's happening in the African American and the American Indian communities. And I will just say, um, so I do look at all racial breakdowns if I have them, but the numbers for like, say the Asian American communities is so low or like the Hispanic ethnicity community. Again, it's so low. I cannot calculate a reliable rate at this point. So that's why we concentrate on those three racial categories, because that's the only one we have the numbers where we can actually calculate something reliable. And again, deaths are driven in Minnesota and in most of the country by fentanyl and meth with apparently some cocaine for the reasons that we discussed, which I just found really interesting. And some of the limitations, we've already talked about a lot of limitations. Some of the limitations are, you know, our medical examiners are overburdened, <laughs> especially um, thanks to COVID on top of everything else, all deaths of violence have also been going up. They look at all those deaths. Um, and I know it, probably some of you have attended Andy Baker's presentations about the crises in the medical examiner community with not having enough people to fill jobs um, now and in the future and, and what can be done, done about that. We still have a percentage of death certificates that don't tell us um, 
give us any clue about the specific drug that was involved with the death. However, luckily we can get around that with suitors now. I think, I don't remember if I pointed this out when we looked at the drug categories, but the drug categories are um, non-exclusive. So a death, one death can show up in multiple categories, which makes sense when we're talking about the large amount of um, polysubstance use. And then as we talked about several times, the death certificates lack detailed circumstantial information. I mean, that's not their job. That's not what the death certificates are for. And that's why um, that other system is funded I, you know, by the CDC is to try to find the circumstances around death to help give more information, useful information to, um, to prevention and policymakers. We do have, it, it's uh, slowly making its way through approval. We do have a descriptive analysis we did on the suitors data just for 2019 that I hope, hope, hope <laughs> will be coming out. Sometime this summer, my previous research analysis, who's been working as the non-fatal overdose epidemiologist for over a year now, she wrote, she did the descriptive analysis of just the 2019 suitors data. And you know, she looked at the basic circumstances like the majority of overdose deaths occur in a residence and um, and things like that. So hopefully I, you know, I that that will be coming out soon, as well as a bunch of other, I'm, I'm in the middle of creating with my communications team a suitors landing page on the MDH website so that various suitors, both ours and the CDC can, can be linked. So yeah, that'd be great. Say Mary, there was, a, there was a question about the gender discrepancy and if, there, if there's been any surmising as to why there's such a difference. Yeah. I. So it, gender doesn't get talked a lot about here in Minnesota or nationally. I, I just know, again, that seems to be the trend, but I've never really heard like prevention folks, you know, or talk about like why they think there is that discrepancy. And, and, I, and I, just, I just don't know the answer to that. Um, and it, it tends to not be something I hear a lot of people talk about it, it which is interesting when you think about it, right? It, it just seems to be accepted. Does, does anyone here have a just a you know an idea about why more men would be dying of overdoses? You know, like we 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 know like general numbers, like for instance, with self-harm, which is like a subset of suicidal ideation that tends to be more female than male, although the male numbers have been going up. Hi, Dana. I didn't even know you were here. Um, uh -oh, Dana oh, no. Dana's here. Well, right. you know, historically, um, uh, men have used drugs more. Um, uh, you know, I won't ask uh, Heather and Kurt to uh, uh, chime in with any personal experiences or field research, but uh, when it comes to impulse decisions, uh, judgment, um, those sorts of things, males in general have typically had, um, you know, I think those decisions um if that's the frontal lobe thing that i think never develops <laughs> yeah that um and so i think historically you know um males whether it's alcohol or other drugs typically the one exception about drugs typically historically has been on some of the tranquilizer the benzodiazepines uh, but that even goes back to the 60s and 70s where that was marketed uh, for women, um, you know, to deal with empty nest syndrome or other things or, or, or being treated as a second class citizen. Um, and, and so I, I think, you know, there's there's some of that historical part as well as, again, sort of that impulse. I don't want to say testosterone, but um, uh, different maturity, especially in youth. Uh, when you take a look at youth, when you think about who gets in trouble at schools, um, you know, there's a variety of things. And I think that kind of reflects it, um, those sorts of things. There could be some more, again, about as different people use drugs. Um, also, if you think about um, what helps us navigate the stresses of life, decisions, a network, um, this might be an overstatement, see what other people think, is um, I think women have different support systems. Um, and so when you're looking at sometimes how to handle stress, how to do some other things, um, I don't know if Murray's on the call, but or other psychologists, you know, I, I think it's some of that 
family role, those sorts of things, a variety of things. So, um, and oh, and I sent folks the um, uh, overdose mortality rate uh, da uh, data that um, uh, Mary had in a different slide that we did a presentation with, and you could see Minnesota there. Um, and Mary, I can't remember what year this was from, uh, but you can see where 2020. we're 2020. You know, we're we're fairly low. Um, at a uh, 19 per 100,000, I think that is, uh, adjusted rate uh, compared to the nation. But again, if you took our uh, Native American rate, uh, that probably, uh, you know, uh, matches uh, maybe maybe West Virginia or somewhere in there. And so our, our uh, Native American and our Black Minnesotans have much higher rate when they're, and what I often say, I'm not an epidemiologist, but, you know, for me, the average or the mean, when we talk about mean or average, the mean masks the meaningful sometimes, and so that's where I think this falls. Mary, great job as usual. Thank you, and I'll All mute right. myself. Let me just quickly say one thing about whenever I see a, a man and a woman on a motorcycle, it's always the woman wearing the helmet. And I always think to myself, it's us guys who just don't think about things, right? I mean, it's like, put the helmet on. Well, so we're careless. I, you know, I was going to say maybe women use the benzos because they have to deal with men and, <laughs> yeah. you know, parenting. And But I also, I also think just in, in full, like, seriousness, you know, with um, what Beth wrote in there, perhaps untreated mental health, I think there probably is stigma against that as well. Like, women maybe it's more acceptable to go get mental health treatment or seek assistance for that now in society. Whereas men, it's maybe more, yeah. you know, masculinity frowned upon. Um, although on the flip side, as we heard last week on echo, you know, women are less likely to seek substance use disorder treatment, um, in certain cultural groups. Yeah. Okay. So there's there's a lot of things in there. Um, just in my quick or in the last couple of minutes, I do want to comment on what Mary asked about the whole greater Minnesota increasing more um, with fentanyl or with the overdose deaths. And I think those of us who practice in at least in our area, it I think it does come down to the fentanyl. Um, you know, we've recently found out that like the number one fentanyl press pill producer in the state lives part-time in Little Falls where we live and part-time in St. Cloud where we work. And so, I mean, I think we, you know, talking with Charlie and our friends in the Twin Cities, I think we were seeing more fentanyl in greater Minnesota than they were in the Twin Cities. I think we saw it faster. So I don't know how much that played in, but I, I it can't be minimized, I think, the fentanyl. It seems to really be different from region to region. Like when I pull possible cases for the different um, fatality review groups, which some of them are broken up by EMS region. Some groups, like virtually all the deaths have meth involved or they're meth alone. And then in some areas, like you said, they're all the synthetic opioid. And I, I'm, I have to, I guess I have to assume it has something to do with the supply. You yep. know what I mean? Like just what, um, what's available. Uh, that's what I'm thinking. It'd be interesting to kind of overlap that analysis with the death to see if it matches up with the um, overdose, the non-fatal overdoses. Do you know oh, what I, I mean? Would, yeah. I think that would be super fascinating to see that because I know some of the friends we have like Ortonville, so way Western, they don't have, I mean, they have opioids clearly, but their meth problem, it, it's proportionately worse. much worse than in other areas. All right. Yeah, in, in the Northeast Minnesota, it, you know, any place it's going to be difficult to document unless we actually have sample, which law enforcement does sometimes testing the sample, but sure does feel like patients are using methamphetamine and improve with naloxone administration and what they tell us at the bedside. I wasn't intent when I say, well, we done some things, you responded to Narcan, we'll wait for some final testing. And the bottom line is, it seems like they unknowingly got fentanyl when they were using methamphetamine. And not to you know, say that that's all the patients, but it, it sure does seem like that's happening. Could I, could I ask you also just to confirm, and um, it was asked in a different way, a little slightly different, but the benzodiazepines that were listed are all benzodiazepines, synthetic, pharmaceuticals, right? Okay. 
Yeah, that category just includes anything that um, the National Center for Health Statistics considers a benzo, basically. I could get you the exact case definition, but. Um, One last question, I think maybe. Not novel benzodiazepines, I believe. Not or yes? Not novel. That's okay. what I've heard anecdotally, that that category, if there's a novel benzo yeah. present, that it won't be included in that category. I haven't been able to verify that or not in Minnesota. So, okay. Sorry. It, no, th thank you. And this, uh, thank you for your presentation. It was great. And I, one more question, whether it's for you or for the crowd. <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering about a reference that I can use, or when we talk about this overall, the idea that folks move on to use illicit opioids because their prescription was discontinued and how we actually documented that. We hear it talked about, it makes sense and suggested. I don't think that speaks to the number of individuals or folks who have a substance use disorder, but the bottom line I'm wondering about, even if we don't know that, the number of individuals reporting, I used illicit substances because my prescription was stopped. Do we have, does anybody have a reference that talks about that? I mean, I could give you a list of patient names if it wasn't violating HIPAA. Yeah, because <laughs> that happens a lot, yeah. Uh, I'll add a reference. I'm looking up a recent reference on that point, Beth. I'll add it to the chat in a, in a minute. I gotta find this first. Great, thanks. But I think, I do think Beth's point the bigger point is that um, overdose death rates is not just about like fentanyl distribution chains, although that's part of it for sure. It could be also access to MOUD. And you could have the same amount of fentanyl in metro as rural, but less access to MOUD, and that would make a difference. Um, so, you know, there's all these various complex, I guess. And, um, and I in the chat, it, it talks about four out of five folks using opioid illicit substances, starting with prescriptions. But that, again, doesn't speak to the source of the prescription. The other thing, it's not the flip side, right? Right. Yeah. So I just well, a Amanda, caution. I've, to, heard, I've heard from patients, they didn't actually even have that prescription. It was. I took it from my mom or grandma or next door neighbor it was their first, you know, prescription of Oxy just wasn't there. So it's even harder to, it's just another element in there. And how does that affect prevention is what I'm curious about, right? Because I'm just thinking, I mean, does it depend on the, the time? Like I have um, a nephew who's, I don't know, in his thirties and he's, been an opioid user since high school, since the surgery. And, you know, that was 20 some years ago. So there's a long period of time. Yes, he started on a prescription. And, but like, how, how do you understand? I don't even know if I'm seeing my question, but like, how would that case be different from a case of somebody who was just on a prescription, like say in 2015 and moved to elicits just in the past seven years because of that the ch big changeover compared to somebody who's always used illicits. Is there a big difference in how you approach prevention and policy for those different groups? I'm I mean, thinking. I would say that part of that thought process is, you know, did they get one prescription and then turn over or is it related to the whole policy of, you know, or monitoring of prescriptions? Because most of things, what we hear is my my doctor wouldn't prescribe anymore. And so then they switched. Or they'll say, I was worried my doctor was about to cut me off based on like things that were being said. And so then I switched. I, I haven't right. seen much of, I got my first prescription, loved it. Now I'm going illicit. It's but, more. Yeah. And I think a lot of the data is really how long did their physician have them on it? Right. So it, because as Charlie knows and Dana knows, and most of the people on the call probably know, the longer they get it from their doctor, the more likely a year from that point they're going to be using it. So I um, see. And one, isn't there some information that supports that somebody who is um, a young, say an adolescent age or teenage that gets a prescription and then sort of their substance use disorder is sort of unveiled um, in part the sort of heads up and I don't think that this speaks to you know how do we do more harm reduction and how do we approach that that 
they were a, a good percentage were using something else before. Well, and I think yeah. there is that, sorry, Dana. Yeah, there is that data point that I haven't seen it more recently. This is a few years ago, but it said, you know, especially the adolescents pre-graduation from high school, it was like a 60 to 65% chance of using something illicit later in life. If you even got a prescription from, you know, a normal surgery, you know, appendix, and you got a couple and Wisdom you used teeth. it correctly as that adolescent age. Um, and, and so that's prevention where it's like education and going into schools and, and having those surgeons or whatever, have that conversation before just handing the prescription out. I think family needs to know that. Dana, 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 you're muted. You're muted though. You're muted, Dana. You're muted. Dana, you are muted. She says, I know. My mouse was uh, being errant or not, uh, <laughs> like I'm trying to move and unclick there. You know, I think a couple things is that, you know, if we looked at our student survey data and, and not so much about drug use, um, but if we take a look at the ACEs um, and just, you know, as the number of ACEs go up, um, you know, there's alcohol use and, and other uh, drug use, marijuana, um, depression, mental health, suicidal ideation. And so if you want to look upstream in prevention, if we think about one, drugs, and I do think behavior is multi-determined, uh, but if you think about drug use as being functional, um, accomplishing something, you know, that is one thing to keep in mind is, um, how do our schools and what do we do to teach resiliency, identify an emotion, problem solving, and other alternatives? On the other hand, then you've got also the selection of, again, not asking anybody on this call to uh, self-identify field research from their adolescents about um, drugs kind of feel good sometimes. And so there's that, you know, and just as running feels good or having a shot of uh, Kurt's uh, maple syrup, you know, those are some things. And, and so there's that dopamine rush or helping the little old lady across the street. There's that saying, you know, first the man takes the drink and then the drink takes the man. I fully believe that SUD is a brain chemistry disorder. And then as what you were saying and indicating, the more that if somebody's on a drug and, per, uh, and particularly the opioids, there is a bi-directional, um, you know, you, you get change in brain chemistry. And when you start trying to, you know, uh, do something different, you see then the effects of that, which is often anxiety, depression, other things, were those exacerbated before? Did the brain chemistry change? Did and and then as you were talking about some patients with injury, um, you have a cascade, not a medication cascade, but I would think an adverse adulthood experience. You lost a job, an injury, uh, loss of identity, vocation, a variety of other things. Uh, that can contribute to somebody using substances to deal with those feelings, emotions, as well as the physical pain. And I think uh, if, if um, our colleague, um, you know, was on our pain psychologist would say how much of that we, we, we have uh, interpret that uh, there. So those are, I think, the multiple pathways. And each one has some different points for intervention and policy. Um, which I don't think we've been successful with. So those are my thoughts on that. Thank you. No, and I, I love that. You're right up my alley with the ACEs and everything. And, and Mary, to comment on what you just wrote with the mortality, the fatality of reviews. You know, I sit on the Maternal Morbidity Mortality Committee, and that is one of the, the big things we are tasked with is coming up with how can we make recommendations, make policy recommendations, make quality improvement things. And that's a huge thing because so many of those deaths do involve substances and it's horribly awful to read those. But, you know, it does go back to where, what was the history of this, this poor birthing person? And I think that goes right. It kind of ties in what you said, Mary, and what you just said, Dana. Well, we're going to have 
I think maybe we'll have an answer to that question in a few years from now as we gather more national level fatality reviews and at least maybe we can have like at least some substantiated theories about like how did the substance use history start so right. all right well g mary we really thank you so much for coming on that was amazing i think the number of questions you feel that is always uh probably the most sorry charlie might be the most we've ever had <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right in there with charlie so no that was fabulous and thanks so much for coming especially so last minute <laughs> thank you so much for having me it was really a pleasure to talk to you all i, I love answering questions